Radio Play Comics is meant to adapt the stories mostly of great unadapted old and forgotten comics from the past. I use voice acting and narration to abridge the work as much as possible without lessening its impact and to bring these stories to life the best way I can. Please enjoy. Hi, I'm Nick, and welcome to the Fusion Space for today's episode of Radio Play Comics, Indiana Jones and the Icons of Ecominen, taken from the ongoing 1983 Marvel series The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. This will continue my short series of indie comics to celebrate the release of the fifth movie, which I have now seen and is quite good. There are a fair amount of indie comics, and other than Fate of Atlantis, none of these stories are available in any other format. There are three main eras of indie comics, firstly an ongoing series Marvel made in the 80s, then a bunch of limited series from Dark Horse in the 90s, and then some more modern comics that came out along with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, also from Dark Horse but with a very different art style. I could never get into the Star Wars or indie novels very well, the films just have such a visual component to me that I couldn't make the connection to the worlds I loved in my imagination. But here in the comics I found that visual component I had been missing and I could enjoy these almost as much as the movies. I hope you'll feel the same. These first two issues of The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones, which I am calling the Icons of Ecominen after one of the chapter titles and the important artifacts it concerns, were written by comics legends John Byrne and Denny O'Neill. John is perhaps best known for revamping Superman in 1986 with his Man of Steel miniseries, and largely helping to find the modern iteration of the character, which is still in use today and Denny should be known to any fans of Batman as one of his longest-serving writers and editors. Known for capturing the classic appeal of old-school visual storytelling, Byrne's talents are put to good use here as he also did the layouts for the art, and these comics, like the films themselves, attempt to capture the appealing essence of a bygone age. The stories are thus split up into tiny chapters, each with their own title, mimicking the long-running Republic serials as well as comics backup features, which both delivered short chapters of ongoing stories over a long period of time, to create and benefit long-term audiences. So know that even though these were published in 1983, they are meant as a throwback to even older comics. Indiana Jones himself is also less defined as a character. Only Raiders of the Lost Ark had come out, and these comics followed after its also popular comics adaptation, which was the first time Indiana Jones appeared in a comic book. His character, as such, was rougher around the edges. It wasn't until Temple of Doom that he was somewhat redefined as more of a superhero-type character. And that movie, as much as I love it, resembles nothing so much as the classic James Bond film. Indy has an adventure getting to a location that seems benign, but under the surface is an actual supervillain kidnapping children and using them in a plot to dominate the world with dark magic and hypnotic powers, and he almost single-handedly saves the day, rescues the innocent, and punishes the evil, as well as returning the stolen magical artifact to the villagers. In Raiders, by comparison, he's just a guy mixed up in a larger operation, a monkey wrench in the gears, causing chaos and riding the wave of it to narrow success. He's making it up as he goes along, as Indy himself likes to put it. That's the Indy you'll see in these adventures, more than the superhero Temple made him into. Though that might change after the Temple of Doom comics did come out in 1984. I haven't read that far myself, and further adventures ran until 1986, for a total of 34 issues. In this story, the icons of Ecominen, we meet Indy at his college, using a whip in class to knock a cigarette out of a student's mouth, who is suffering through this demonstration for extra credit something I find it hard to imagine the Indy we know as a fully developed character ever doing, but which is understandable given only his Raiders portrayal, and shows what an unusual sort of professor he is. I also think the editor might have said to make sure he's using the whip on the first page, no matter what. In any case, an old student soon shows up with a mystery in hand, and he is murdered from afar, leaving only the mystery behind. Indy pursues it and meets the dead man's sister, also seeking the fabled treasure, a set of golden statues known as the Icons. Though both get mixed up with some gun-toting criminals also looking for the gold, who force Indy to be their pawn and infiltrate the sacred temple to bypass the traps. It's all danger and chases, traps and shootouts, magic and mystery, fortune and glory. It's the further adventures of Indiana Jones, and I hope you'll enjoy them. Now, let's begin. The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones Chapter 1 Just don't move, Miss Greebly, and you won't get hurt. Maybe. 
Professor Jones uncoils his whip while a student stands in his classroom, holding a cigarette in her mouth. Just as Marcus Brody enters. Good heavens, Indiana! The whip cracks, knocking the cigarette away and leaving the young lady unharmed. You can consider your extra credit assignment completed. D does that mean... Of course, your A is now an A+. Indiana, why? I needed the practice. But you could have injured her with that thing. They'd have thrown you in jail for life. Without risks, there isn't much point to it all. Or much fun, either. Indiana, if you weren't the most popular archaeology teacher on the faculty, if you didn't bring in thousands of dollars in grants every year, you'd fire me. Dr. Marcus, unless you have something new to say, you'll have to excuse me. I have an appointment. Faculty meeting? No. Pistol practice. Uh, you made me so flustered I forgot. Someone's waiting to see you. A former student. A Charlie Dunn. Dunn? He was headstrong, irresponsible, undisciplined. The best student I ever had. Professor Jones, good to see you again, sir. Forget the sir, and while you're at it, forget the professor. The name is Indy. What brings you to the old alma mater? A discovery pro- Indy? My sister Edith and I have learned the locations of the icons of Ecomenen. As Indy shakes Charlie's hand, a mysterious figure lurks outside his open window with a knife. As the saying goes, don't kid a kidder. The icons are a nice legend, but nobody really believes they exist. Including me. Statues capable of becoming living Avengers? Not a bad yarn to wake up a snoozing freshman or two, but... I don't know about becoming Avengers, but I can prove the icons exist. My sister and I... Ch ah! Done! Suddenly, Charlie falls over, dead, with the knife stuck in his back. He's dead! And whoever threw that knife must have ducked around the building. Not a chance in the world of catching him. Let's have a look at what he wanted to show us. Maps of coastal Africa with one area circled in red. A photo of the temple or shrine. And an address. Miss Edith Dunn, Hotel Fod, Creek Amiibo, Liberia. Oh, what should we do? You are going to call the police and play their games. I am going to send a wire to Edith Dunn. And then, I'm going to pack. As of two minutes ago, I am on a leave of absence. You're leaving? Just like that? It's... 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 Risky. Risky is the word, Marcus. Indy takes off his glasses, then collects his whip and puts on his hat before walking out the door. Chapter 2. Interested Parties. 28 hours later. A spanking new DC-3 drones high over the North Atlantic, bound east on the first leg of a day-long flight to Africa. For Indiana Jones, the trip will not end when the plane reaches its final destination. Another 30 hours by steamer will be required to bring him to... Krikambo. Nestled against the northwest edge of the great African continent, a seaport town older than the presence of white men in these climes. Indiana Jones has been here only once before. Looks a lot like the town where I was with Marion, before we went looking for the Ark. Yoo-hoo, Dr. Jones. Edith greets Indy, decked out in her own form of jungle exploring gear. It's me, Edith Dunn. Do you remember? How could I forget? You got my cablegram? Sorry about your brother. The main reason I'm here is to find out why he was killed and who did it. Then do something about it. Our starting place is the icons. I reserved you a room at my hotel, and I can show you the rest of the information we've gathered on the icons. Er, uh, Edith, I don't think you should talk about that so openly, do you? But why not, Dr. Jones? The icons are of enormous archaeological importance, but of no practical value, surely? I think you're forgetting something, Edith. If the icons do exist, they're made of solid gold. On the street, men in robes take notice of the travelers. And, less than ten minutes later, Indy looks around while Edith talks to the hotel's concierge. I think I'll have to revise my opinions of Edith. If she's stayed alive in this dive until now, she's got more spunk, more luck, than I ever gave her credit for. Right in here, Doctor. Edith opens her room, only to find it ransacked. Oh, my! Uh-oh, look out, Edith. 
We've got visitors. Suddenly, Indy is grabbed as men fill the room. <laughs> the robed figures are a blur of swirling death. But Indiana Jones is a survivor. He shoves the man's head down and leaps over him. <laughs> swinging his other fist to punch the swordsman behind him. <laughs> and though sometimes that survival may not be easily won, Indy catches a knee in the stomach. <laughs> in the end, he will always prevail. Edith is picked up. Oh, Dr. Jones! What? Edith! Almost always. Then, while he knocks out his attacker. <laughs> oh no! Edith! She is thrown out the window. <laughs> oh, Dr. Jones! Indy socks one more as he turns to the window. <laughs> That's just fine. She survived in this hole all by herself for weeks. I'm only here an hour and she's... Dead? On the street, he sees Edith struggling as someone carries her away. <laughs> Maybe not. But she'll be long out of sight by the time I get down there. Always assuming I take the stairs. The tools of an archaeologist's trade are many, though a bullwhip has never been traditional. Indy lashes his whip around a post and swings down to the street, crashing into a fruit stand. <laughs> but then, Indiana Jones is hardly a traditional archaeologist. He gets up and gives chase. <laughs> hey, you! Somebody stop that guy! <sighs> His call goes unheeded. In this town, in this quarter, men have learned to keep to their own business. Dr. Jones, help! Indy chases him through the crowd of people. So it is that no one comes to Edith's aid, as Indiana races through an impossible maze of back streets, keeping his quarry always just in sight. They round corners and run down alleyways. He's not much of a kidnapper. Even in this mess, I haven't lost track of him. Either he's very clumsy, or I'm very lucky. Or perhaps, he did not wish you to lose him, Dr. Jones. Indy turns down a blind alley, but his quarry has vanished. Gone! Indiana has only a moment to realize the enclosure is a dead end. <laughs> before an iron door transforms it into a box. A box suddenly without a bottom. As trap doors open. <laughs> hey! The drop is only a dozen feet, cushioned by an ancient and decaying mattress, <clears throat> which quickly turns into a most unconventional mode of transportation as Indy slides through the darkness. <clears throat> and at journey's end, it's black as tar down here. <clears throat> Even the light of a match just gets swallowed. But it's enough to show me I'm not alone. Rats scurry away from Indy in the light. Don't think I can climb back up the ramp. And the only other way out of here is... <clears throat> locked. Natch. Luckily, I always carry my own key. Indy draws his pistol. Gunfire echoes deafeningly in the small stone room, overwhelming the sound of splintering oak. As Indy shoots through the lock. <clears throat> and a moment later, a foot now achieves what a hand could not. As he kicks the door open. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Jones. May I offer you a cup of coffee? Chapter 3 Dealing in the Dark Indiana Jones is addressed by a short and stocky man on a throne, surrounded by piles of gold and riches. Edith is being held by a guard next to him. The voice is rich and almost without accent. But the sense of power, the implied menace, are unmistakable. Please put away that ridiculous weapon, Dr. Jones. You will not need it here. I think I'll just hang on to it for a while, if that's all the same to you. I found it helps me sometimes to get answers. And I think you owe me a few, no? For instance, who are you? And why are you threatening Miss Dunn and me? Have you been threatened, Dr. Jones? The louts I sent to escort you here exceeded my orders if they harmed you. But you are right. Introductions are in order. My name is Solomon Black, and I am a businessman. I think you will find our interests are complementary. It is for that reason I have had my agents monitoring Miss Dunn. 
monitoring. Well, that explains how she was able to survive in this town for more than a day. Of course. The icons they become in then are of incredible value. And when I learned this child's brother had stumbled onto an apparent access to them, it became convenient to keep her safe until he arrived. Instead, you come in his place. You talk as though Charlie found the icons alone. The discovery was at least half mine. But you won't believe that. Nobody ever thinks I can do anything. Anyway, none of this matters. The important thing is the historical significance of the icons. Professor Jones, all Black's interested in is the gold. I'd already guessed that much. Sorry, Black, but this is strictly a non-profit operation. You mean it was, Dr. Jones. But now I have involved myself. And Solomon Black wastes neither time nor effort on something that will not show suitable profit. But to underscore my sincerity... But a sudden fluid motion as the guard holds a knife to Edith's neck. <clears throat> Dr. Jones! You see, Doctor, one word from me and vote will slit Miss Dunn's pretty throat. Not a pleasant way to end her young life. I think you'll agree. Indy aims his gun. Can he do it before I plug you, Black? Inconsequential detail. Miss Dunn will still be most painfully dead. <sighs> All right, point taken. Tell me exactly what you want out of this arrangement. After Indy agrees to help, Solomon arranges passage for them all on a steamship. Dawn. Isn't this a Czechoslovakian ship, Dr. Jones? Yeah, it is, Edith. With a hold full of explosives bound for the African mines. That is why we maintain the radio silence. These waters are patrolled by German submarines. One of their torpedoes and boom. Now, to the map. It is not very precise, Miss Dunn. I did the best I could. I'm sure you did, my dear. But I know these waters very well. If your maps are to be believed, the island we see, he points on the map, is right about here, in the middle of empty ocean. But two days later, Edith spots the island from the deck. There it is. Charlie couldn't have found it any better. Not much to look at, is it? That small and shrouded in fog? You'd never find it unless you were looking for it. However, the captain sees through binoculars that several other ships lie wrecked all around it. I was afraid of this, Mr. Block. Those ships must have run aground in the fog. Or even been lured in somehow. Whatever the case, I'll not risk my ship by taking her any closer to shore. I quite agree, Captain. I do not wish to end my days as shark food. Dr. Jones can go ashore in a dinghy with two of my men. Miss Dunn will, of course, stay here. Think that one through again, Black. I'm not leaving Edith with you and your cutthroat crew. I will not debate. If it is so important that she go with you, she can. After all, Doctor, where is there to run? Minutes later, the creak of chain and timbers accompanies the lowering of a small boat. <coughs> The compact motor brings them quickly to shore. Dr. Jones, what's wrong with the jungle? The plants are all black. No time to worry about that just now, Edith. We've got to get this boat ashore and hidden. Who knows what the natives might think of strangers. But as the first man reaches the beach, a swarm of arrows flies out from the bushes, killing Solomon's man while Indy shoves Edith behind the boat. Down! Huh. Uh. <laughs> no further fire. I don't believe a whole swarm of natives just happened to be on the same stretch of beach we pick for a landing. Give me that knapsack. I think I'll test a theory. Indy tosses the bag onto the beach and ducks the resulting volley of arrows. I was right. The beach is booby-trapped. The other gangster holds a gun on them. Then you had better be very careful going ashore, Dr. Jones, if you do not wish to end up like my comrade. Oh, fine. But, Dr. Jones, how can we cross without getting killed? Leave that to me, sweetheart. A big part of archaeology is just staying alive. The crossing is slow and arduous, 
and something less than dignified. Indiana Jones slowly and carefully searches the sand ahead of them with a stick as they crawl up the beach. Steady, no trip ropes through here. Finally, they enter the jungle. I was beginning to think we'd never get off that beach, but where are the natives? This is probably an area they don't come through much. That's why they booby-trap the beach. The jungle is so silent and dead. Twenty-five minutes of hard going later, Indy gives Edith a hand as they climb up a rocky hill. Watch your step, Edith. I think this rock is lava. It's too smooth to be ordinary stone. And as the summit is mounted. Well, well, well. Looks like you get your name in the journals after all, Edith. Chapter 4 the icon, the V. Kamenen. Looking down into a valley surrounded by mountains, Indy and Edith see a massive structure in the center of an empty village. There is no sound but their own labored breathing. A weight of time beyond measure presses upon this place. Impressive. That tower must be fifteen stories high. They climb down and head for the tower. But I don't recognize the style. It's no African culture I know of. It looks real old. I wouldn't expect to place it immediately. The village isn't characteristic either, and still no sign of natives. They may be out fishing or something, although I'd expect to see women and kids at least. Now be careful. We don't know what's in here. Unless it's... Inside, incredibly detailed, life-sized golden statues of humans form a ring around a central platform beneath a large hanging chain. The icons, I'll be darned, they are real. The inscriptions on the base supposedly tell how to bring them to life. It would be interesting to translate them and give it a try, but we have other things to worry about just now. This place makes no sense. The natives must have swiped this chain and pulley system from one of the grounded ships, but this tower is a couple of thousand years older than that, at least. Up close, Indy sees the end of the chain has been dipped in gold. And there are splotches of gold everywhere, as if it dripped from something. Dr. Jones, this altar, stone, it's hot. There must be a fire beneath. And look at the icons themselves. I've never seen such absolute realism in primitive tribal art. Oh, Dr. Jones, I don't like this place. I'm frightened. Nothing to be scared of, kid. They're just statues. Hmm. They're fastened in place with blobs of melted gold. If I can pull one free, we can take it back to Black Ship and worry about the others later. He tugs fruitlessly for several moments. Then, the icon snaps off at the knees. <laughs> it broke! And, from within the suddenly truncated figure. <laughs> human bones! Oh my gosh! Edith, these aren't statues! They're... <laughs> Suddenly, Indy is hit in the back of the head by a crude rock sling. Later, Indiana Jones awakens to find himself hanging from the large chain. His hands and feet are bound. The softness of another body is felt behind him. Then, a response from the past. Don't look, Marion! Don't... Oh. It's not Marion, and not then. He is here, now amidst a most uncomfortable reality, struggling to overcome the familiar nightmare. Dr. Jones, are you all right? I'm okay. Who's the Joker in the feathers? I'm not sure. They broke my glasses when they jumped me, but I think they're all old men. They look it. Maybe that's why we didn't see any women or kids. This village has been here a long time, and these old fellows are the only ones left. But what are they doing now? The men in feathered cloaks and headdresses push the top off the platform. The blast of hot air is like a furnace swinging open. <laughs> and, as the great stone inches back, yellow light floods the chamber. <laughs> and a switch is manipulated. Link by link, the chain lowers as the terrible heat buffets the captives. They're gonna lower us into the gold! Dr. Jones, do something! I'm working on it! His false bravado rings mockingly against the ancient stones as the dead, blind eyes of the icons stare on. To be continued. 
22 Carat Doom. Heat shimmers in the air, and the caustic odor of molten metal pervades this African temple, and Edith Dunn's voice is a hoarse, terrified whisper. Dr. Jones, are they really going to put us in that boiling gold and make statues of us? Yeah, unless we get what we need. A miracle. Or the best idea I ever had. Creaking and scraping in the stillness, the chain lowers its frightened burdens. <laughs> Can you read the inscriptions on the icons? Maybe they'll help. Not likely. It's some mumbo-jumbo about raising the dead, wreaking vengeance on the wicked. We need something to keep us from getting dead in the first place. As I said, a miracle. Suddenly, the temple trembles and a bone-numbing noise booms through it. <laughs> Somebody's setting off high explosives. Our playmates are going to check on it. Is this the miracle? Probably not. Outside, Solomon's men lay siege to the tower with guns and explosives. The dynamite routed the first herd of savages, but there are more in the temple. Surround them and shoot. To kill, naturally. When my brother and I were taking your classes, you didn't tell us archaeology was like this. Didn't want to spoil the surprise. The explosion must have loosened the foundations of the temple. Whole place is coming down around our ears. That gives us a chance. It does? Yeah, it's causing the chain to swing. We've got to help it. Pump, Edith, like you did on the playground swings when you were a kid. Indy kicks his legs out, swinging them in a rhythm. Huh. Shh. Shh. I wa wasn't allowed on the playground. Oh, only my brother was. Then pretend you're him. Just do it. We've got to hit the lever. Huh. But that will release the chain, and we'll fall into the gold. So stop it, you so stupid man. We've only got a few seconds left. He swings, and Indy's feet brush against the lever. Huh. He swings back, missing again. Huh. Finally, he kicks the lever dead on. Huh. Made it, and they fall to the floor. Huh. Not a moment too soon. Well, uh, alive? As I figured, our momentum carried us beyond the gold pit. Of course, if I'd misjudged by a couple of inches. They untied themselves. I'd rather not think about it. I'm just lucky it was your office my brother got himself knifed in. Have you noticed how quiet it's gotten? Too quiet. Black and the crew from the ship probably caused the ruckus. Fighting the natives, I guess. Somebody must have won. Let's go see who. Solomon and his men enter the chamber. Black? Ah, Dr. Jones and the charming Miss Dunn. I wish to thank you for your services. For finding a path past the various traps to the temple. For leading me to the icons I so dearly covet. Unfortunately, I no longer require your assistance. Shoot them. As the gangster aims his gun, a dart sticks into his neck. With pleasure. <laughs> He falls down, dead. Something hit his neck. A poison dart. Present from the locals. They're back, and they don't like us. Any of us. He won't be needing this. Indy takes his gun and fires at the natives. <laughs> but I will. Black, we'd better postpone our disagreement for the time being. Indeed we shall. At least until we have dealt with the hostility of the tribesmen. The other men join him as the tribesmen rush them with spears. They're pulling out all the stuff, attacking in force. We're surrounded. Head for the beach. I'm scared. Indy and Edith run to avoid a volley of spears. Uh-oh. Problems. They've cut off the path to the water. What can we do? Make it up as we go along. These huts look pretty flimsy. Should come down with out much effort. Indy slams his shoulder into the building support post, collapsing it, and he takes cover behind the rubble and fires. <laughs> there. It wouldn't stop a rifle slug, but against spears it'll do fine. I should never have let you talk me into this. Lady, you asked me to find the icons, and your brother's murderer, remember? Will you get down? He shoves Edith to safety just as a spear flies by overhead. <laughs> if you're gonna get yourself killed, do it somewhere else. The other men take cover next to Indy and fire, and they gun down the attacking natives in a line. They're dropping like flies! 
<laughs> they really don't have a chance against firearms. Too bad. You have to admire their guts. Not me. <laughs> ah, that's that. Another triumph for decency, culture, civilization, and automatic weapons. Dr. Jones? Where were we before we were so rudely interrupted? Ah, yes. You were about to be killed. Shall we resume? Can you suggest any reason we should not? Indiana Jones and Solomon Black hold their guns on each other. A couple. One is that I'll probably be able to drop you before I die. But you know that. I mentioned it the last time we played this little scene. I'm scared. The risk is considerable, I will admit. Still, risk is a part of my business. Your other reason? Without me, you won't get the rest of the goodies. The inscriptions on those icons tell the location of a second cache of golden statues. There aren't a dozen men in the world able to translate the inscriptions. I'm one of them. It'll take time and certain reference materials, but I could do it. Hmm. Haha. <laughs> I should be happy to have you and Miss Dunn as my honored guests, Dr. Jones. And... By nightfall, men are loading large crates into boats to be taken to Solomon's ship. You've got to hand it to Black. He's a pig, but he's an efficient pig. His thugs got those icons crated in less than an hour. At this rate, we'll be underway by dawn. Then we might even be lucky enough to avoid the war in this part of the globe. Two hours later. They've locked us in. It could be worse. At least we're in a cabin. I expected Black to toss us in the brig. When will you begin work on the translation? There's nothing to translate. I made up that stuff to keep us from getting shot. I was hoping to get into the radio room and signal for help. Oh, the door locked and Black's goon outside with a gun. Perhaps I could do something. Such as? I could lure the guard with feminine wiles? <laughs> well, with all due respect, Edith, what feminine wiles? Oh, I've learned a few things outside the classrooms. I have a gown in my luggage. Close your eyes while I change. Why not? And? You can open your eyes now. Edith stands before Indy in a loose, sheer, flowing dress which complements the curves of her figure. I have, and I'm glad. Edith, you amaze me. Then? Mister, could you come here a minute? Dr. Jones is asleep, and I'm... Lonely. Very, very lonely. Awfully lonely. Well, sure, Dolly. I guess there ain't no harm in keeping you cup. <laughs> Indy sucker punches the guard as he enters. Nice going, Edith. You stay here, lock the door, and put this bum's gun to his head. If he moves, blow it off. I'll try to send an SOS from the radio shack. If I'm not back in 30 minutes, you're on your own. Presently. A fine patch of daisies this is. Don't use the equipment, they say. Maintain radio silence, they say. The trouble with talking to herself is somebody might answer. Indy claps a hand over the radio man's mouth as he pulls him out of his chair and knocks him out. <laughs> <laughs> My Morse code is a bit rusty, but it should serve. I only hope someone's nearby to pick it up. <laughs> Suddenly, as Indy sends a message with the ship's telegraph, a gun goes off behind him, hitting the radio. <laughs> a shot! And a minute later, Look, the day! We got your boyfriend, Dolly. Why don't you do yourself a favor and drop the heater? Now wait! I demand to see Mr. Black! Immediately! You'll see him, all right. Edith tries to hold the guards off of the gun, but she is grabbed from behind. Ah! But you ain't gonna like it. Within moments, I am, as you Americans say, Dr. Jones, fed up. Me too. Take them on deck, where they will walk the plank. Indy is forced to surrender as well, and they are taken to the ship's deck. I respect the customs of the sea. I am, by nature, deeply traditional. You're also deeply corny. And aren't you forgetting the translation? I shall find another expert to do it, Dr. Jones. You have proven yourself untrustworthy. A half league away, a periscope fixes on the freighter. A command is barked and... Bark! 
A torpedo is launched from a German sub. <sighs> Indy spots it in the water. A torpedo? A German submarine must have caught my radio signal. We're aboard a Czechoslovakian ship, and the Nazis aren't getting along with the Czechs these days. We won't walk the plank, we'll run! He grabs Edith and leaps off the ship. <gasps> <gasps> Two explosions. First, the Nazi warhead, and three seconds later, a hold full of dynamite. <laughs> a stench of burning oil and hot metal mingles with the salt tang of the sea, and the faint howls of trapped and shattered men are silenced by the rush of water as the ship begins to sink. <laughs> A crate pops up above the water with Indy and Edith clinging to it. <sighs> Looks like it's just you and me, Edith. We ought to thank that treacherous rat Black if he hadn't put us on the plank. We mustn't lose the icon. It's the only proof of my... our achievement. Someday you'll have to explain exactly which achievement you mean. The submarine surfaces as well. There's the U-boat. They owe us a rescue. Hey! Deutschlanders! Ahoy! And all are soon brought on board. Your country and mine aren't officially at war. Not yet, Herr Captain. So dunking a couple of U.S. citizens probably makes you guilty of about eight international crimes. But I won't be fussy about that. Get us and our property to America and we'll call it square. And give me dry clothes, you stinkers! Exactly one month later. <laughs> We are a kilometer from New York, Dr. Jones. We give you a boat to go ashore. I have enjoyed our talks. I wish I could say the same. That afternoon at Idlewild Airport. Isn't it exciting? I've hired an airplane to fly me and my icon home. They're dedicating a whole wing of the museum to us. You and your brother? No, silly. Me and my icon. Oh, it's a shame that Charlie was murdered and all. I'm sure he'd agree. But I took the risks, and I deserve the glory. Every bit of it. Be careful with that, you men. The crated relic is loaded onto a small plane. The newspapers will be there, and the radio, and Life magazine, and the movie newsreels. And me. I'd like to tag along. What for? So you can hog some of the spotlight? No, Edith, you're welcome to the fame. It's just that I feel an obligation to Charlie. An obligation to take care of you. Well... All right. Soon, the plane is airborne. <sighs> I'll say it again, Edith. You amaze me. You might still get clean away with it. Whatever are you blathering about? Charlie's murder. You really did want the glory for yourself, didn't you? Or was there another reason? Were you tired of always being in Charlie's shadow? Did you hate him for that? How dare you! Can it, sweetheart? I've suspected almost from the beginning. And ever since our little adventure on the ship, I've been certain. I've got to hand it to you, though. You're good. You're very, very good. You'd have fooled me completely if it hadn't been for a couple of tiny things. What might those have been, Doctor? You mentioned that your brother was killed in my office. How'd you know? I didn't tell you. <laughs> then, at the radio shack on the ship, you fired at me. <laughs> It wasn't any of the crew or Black's men. They came after they heard the shot. You had a gun and a motive. You figured with me dead, you could make a deal with Black. Lucky for me, you'd lost your glasses. Without them, you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. What you didn't do was actually throw the dagger into your brother's back. You were in Africa at the time with Black's men watching you. I wonder who did do your dirty work. A man emerges from the cockpit holding a gun. I did, pal. I took care of that night throwing chore for Edie. Swell job, too. Jerry here appreciates me. He loves me for myself. And for the money the discovery of the icon will undoubtedly bring in. Right, Jerry? Shut up, pally. Plane's an automatic pilot, Edie. Name your pleasure. I want the high and mighty Dr. Indiana Jones to die. Kill him. I gave you a choice, pally. You can stop a slug here. Or you can step outside. Mine is a parachute, of course. That way, you got a few seconds to say your prayers. There might be a third possibility. 
I had a month on that sub to decipher the inscription at the base of the icon. It's interesting. A formula for bringing vengeance to the wicked. I'd say you people qualify, wouldn't you? Don't listen to his nonsense. Shut up. I like crazy stories. Go ahead, Pally. Tell us this magic formula. It's in words that must be spoken in the presence of an icon. These words. Busta, Coddle, De, Harg. Huh? The crate. Open it. And the statue. Climb it out. Not exactly a statue. A gold-encrusted Avenger. Jerry shoots the golden figure with his gun, but to no avail. <laughs> Save your bullets. He's already dead. Stop it, Jones! I couldn't if I wanted to. Indy straps on a parachute. I'll set the controls to take this kite over the Atlantic. I wouldn't want whatever came out of that box to be walking around loose. Now I'll take your suggestion and step outside. Only with shoot. I won't wish you luck, Edith. That'd be a lie. And anyway... It's too late. As golden hands reach for Edith's neck, <laughs> Indiana Jones jumps out of the plane. <sighs> Once in the air, he pulls his ripcord and his parachute deploys. <sighs> but I will remember you. The longest day I live, I will never forget Edith Dunn. And if I were the praying kind, I'd do that for you too. A shriek. Then a scream of consuming terror, a cry of the wicked that is quickly lost in the distant grumble of thunder and the whistle of a sudden chilling wind. <laughs> End. Next, Into the Devil's Cradle. And now I'll briefly recap the third issue just to resolve that cliffhanger ending. Indy safely floats down to a jungle below, only to find a man cornered by a group of men and about to be hanged. He rescues the man, holding the crowd off with his whip, and they escape. They attempt to cross a rope bridge, but their pursuers cut it loose, and Indy and his new friends scramble up the rocky cliff on the far side, finally ending the chase. The man brings Indy to meet an old man in a cave who claims to be Prospero, extending his life with a magical elixir, and who is fighting the soldiers in the jungle to protect his special spring and who plans to bring the mountain itself down upon them. After a few fights, captures, and escapes, Indy finally uses an artillery gun to shoot the mountain and make the rocks fall safely away from the people. With the cave sealed, Prospero and his companion move on to search for another spring. The next story, which begins with this really cool cover, is about Stonehenge, where an artifact has been newly discovered, a crystal cylinder covered in unknown symbols. Indy is asked by the British government to retrieve it before the Nazis can. Paired with an attractive female language expert, he finds the item, and they make a quick escape by jumping out the four-story window of their hotel, only to bounce safely from an awning below and jump in a taxi for a speedy getaway. They figured out enough from the symbols to know the crystal predates recorded history and refers to ancient entities who left this place via a magic gateway, and something about a possible return. Eventually, they commandeer another car, but are driven off a bridge. Indy barely casts his whip and swings them to safety before the car falls into the river below. More fights, chases, and escapes follow, including Indy driving a motorcycle with sidecar over a collapsing rope bridge. But finally, they end up captured, and the Nazis get the crystal, bringing them both along to Stonehenge. The Nazis activate the circle of stones with the crystal, and a huge portal begins to open in the sky. Indy is horrified to see what resembles gigantic snakes, but also hints of other primal animal forms as well. As the entities reach for the earth, Indiana is sorely tempted by the lost knowledge they might possess, but he realizes that it's too dangerous a chance to take to allow them through, and regretfully destroys the artifact, closing the portal as well. So I think by now you can see the pattern this book would follow, weaving in both famous and fictional artifacts and entities, and pairing Indy with a variety of temporary partners. I think it's interesting to see how many things that became hallmarks of the later indie movies would first make an appearance here in this book, but it's not that the filmmakers took inspiration from here. Rather, all of these things, like the breaking rope bridge and being lowered by chain into a hot substance of doom, were always part of the old Republic serials and adventure films that George and Stephen loved. So that's the source that both the book and later the film would draw upon. 
I'll be adapting one more Indiana Jones comic to finish up this short series, and I've chosen 2008's Tomb of the Gods, which was made as part of the wave of merchandise that accompanied Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which many fans might complain about, and while I don't think it's without flaws, they don't hurt my ability to enjoy the movie when I watch it. Tomb of the Gods has nothing to do with the movie, though, and is set during Indy's Prime in 1936, and features an adventure that takes him from the high-rise buildings of New York City to the deepest unexplored parts of Antarctica and all over the world between as he races against the Nazis once again to assemble an ancient stone key, along with yet another comely female partner with undetermined alliances. But this time he faces a unique choice, because the artifact may open up the way to something more dangerous than anyone anticipates and perhaps the only right thing to do is not to discover its secret. I might well come back and adapt some more of the 90s Dark Horse comics over time, but I really just wanted to show what the indie comics were like with this series and hopefully direct some new fans to them, if you're like me and the movies and games always left you wanting more adventures. Until next time, take care out there, and as always, thanks for watching.